the very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of Machine and Conscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, we are sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's guest, consider tossing us a buck a month at www.patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H or leave us a review on iTunes. And today, friend of the show, friend of mine, Jeremy Smith, he is a translator of Francois Laurel and he is finishing a dissertation on, do you still call it the endemic, Jeremy, on non-humanism? Do you still, using that phrase? So I think I have a solidified title of yeah, yeah. the uh, the oh, thesis. This, I want to hear the title. This is great. I mean, I'm kind of like at this point where I've gone through so many titles yeah. that I'm just like so disappointed with myself each time. <laughs> to begin with, I could tell you about like how many times this, this title has changed. Like yeah. I wanted to like do a very classical Kantian title like uh, rebellion within the bounds of the people alone. That's good. But, I like that one. But I really just felt like I was doing much more than I needed to. And I think a title of a work really is not always the best indicator of, we should not have like flashy titles for PhD theses. I agree, I agree <laughs> with that. There's a whole Twitter account devoted to bad PhD yeah. theses. So you want to you avoid being on that. Yeah, exactly. So I have decided instead of doing that, I'm going with very something very simple. It's played <coughs> off of uh, the play by Shono Casey called The Plow in the Stars. And I'm titling my thesis, The Cave in the Stars. The reason why I title it this is for several reasons. One is to obviously play off of Shono Casey because in an interview that was published in, I want to say, 2017, 2018 of Anne-Francois Schmid, who's Laurel's wife mm -hmm. and was in dialogue with Laurel, mentions that from time to time, Laurel cites this book, not only because he grew up as the son of a farmer and became a philosopher, yeah. but because he transforms it in um, the recent book that he wrote, Tetralogos, into From the Cave to the Stars. Of course, like I'm doing something along the lines of that, but mm -hmm. also the plow in the stars is in reference to the Irish citizens army, oh. uh, which was a part of Irish independence in the early 20th century, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. There's two lines that kind of like cement that movement. One is from, um, I want to say Michael Connolly. The leader of the Irish citizen army. Let me just okay. James Connolly. James, James Connolly said something along the lines of the Irish people will only be free when they own everything from the plow to the stars. Beautiful. There's that, and there's a biblical verse from Isaiah 2 4. I'm going to use the King James. And yeah. he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their oh. spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. All of these kinds of things coalesce in what I would say the cave in the stars because of the idea that invention is the possibility for emancipation and that there needs to be a basis for some sort of emancipatory practice in non-philosophy, or at least to recognize that in its work. So I'm doing this title sort of like poetic justice in the yeah. work. And the subtitle is The Human Emancipation of Non-Philosophy. So the full title. Cave That's a good stars, title. Thank you. The Cave in the Stars, The Human Emancipation of Non-Philosophy. I like it. 
You know, what's interesting is when you were talking about uh, going through titles in your head, this is something that I think that, uh, you know, I've done in the past, like for something as simple as a conference paper, you, you, you spend so much time thinking about the title because it is kind of, even before you, you have your hook in your opening paragraphs, it is kind of the thing that draws people, right? That people sometimes may not read more than that. But you're right. You can spend too much time on it. But I think that you got a banger there with, with uh, <laughs> the cave and the stars. And I like the references, especially the one to Isaiah, the beating the swords and the plowshares, which is, you know, taken on all kinds of popular imagery. In fact, I first learned of it. I was like a kid playing Magic the Gathering. And there was a card called the Swords to Plowshares. And it was like, it was kind of an overpowered card. So like that kind of got me to think that sounds poetic. That sounds like it's from something and, it, and it's from the Bible. So sometimes the Bible has good stuff. If you don't thump it. Anyway, I yeah. like the title and I'm glad that I asked. We can talk more about the endemic later with, you know, humanism, non-humanism, these things. We've been asking a lot of the guests to start off just with telling us a little bit about Taylor's been kind of cleverly calling it kind of your philosophical origin story. So I guess just broadly, what sort of was the inciting incident or like what sort of, if there is one, you know, if there is a sort of singularity in terms of philosophy that kind of hooked you and then branching off of that, the second aspect would be, I guess, specific to Laura Well. <laughs> Always a tough question to do like an autobiography on the spot, an autobiography of an ordinary man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell us your ordinary story. <laughs> well, I'm from New York City, born and raised in Staten Island, New York, or Shaolin, if you listen to Wu Tang. Um, I grew up there and lived back and forth taking the Staten Island ferry every day for oh, like wow. the past decade. My education in my academics in particular, I've always had, I had a background in media and cultural studies. I had like a lot of moments of undeclared disciplines or, mm -hmm. you know, undeclared in general. So I started off jumping around from sociology to anthropology to, to then setting myself up in this very interdisciplinary context. Mm -hmm. But, you know, much like other humanities programs where philosophy plays more of in philosophy departments throughout the country, it's usually analytic philosophy. Yes. And so I only had something of a um, peripheral insight or entry into philosophy through media and cultural studies. So I started off your basic Frankfurt School mm -hmm. kind of scholarship, reading the first time. I think my mind exploded when I was reading uh, Benjamin's uh, yeah. work of art essay. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of people who deal with media studies are like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, that's always the first essay you read. <laughs> the <And> aura, the <laughs> aura. The aura is disappearing. Oh, no. Uh, what we do, we politicize art. That's great. A lot of this was very much informing me and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm TAing now and have students who are reading this essay for the first time, they're like, wow, yeah. you know, everything is, is drastically altering from reading this. So for me, at least, when I have a background in media and cultural studies, I did my BA at Eugene Lang College, the new school. Mm -hmm. I worked with Mackenzie Wark for nice. my uh, BA thesis. I was working on most of my experience in undergrad because I was at the new school, was informed by like, you know, a lot of Derrida, Deleuze, and yeah. Foucault, a lot of the French theory that we're all familiar of. And then I went to NYU. So debt is on the topic, <laughs> you know, like student debt is a big thing to talk about these days. So yeah. I like to, yeah. you know, I like to be candid about how much of it I'm in debt for both of these institutions. Same. This is, a, yeah. this is, this is my fault. And now I'm living in in Canada, so needless I'm never to paying say, mine back. I, I plan on never, I'm never. They're never getting all of it. Yeah, no, and I, I, I'll let I civilization would, collapse before I pay it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, don't say it's your fault. I don't want to. No, hear no, it. no, no. I'm not blaming myself. Okay, I'm okay. Blaming, okay. I'm blaming everything but me. <laughs> yes, you know exactly. Uh, exactly. This is this, as this one is, stood. This is now the yeah. debt. This is now the debt podcast. We are all we are, we, they can come pry it out of our cold dead hands. Uh, you can hear our chain shackling our like shackles yeah exactly in We're the background dancing in our chains. Yeah, yeah so, somebody dancing. somebody quote Nietzsche's genealogy of morals and uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, continue, but yeah, 
I did my MA on something about the Anthropocene. If anybody wanted to like read it, I don't think I have it anymore because it was on my institutional email account. I have no access to that whatsoever anymore. But it was on the Anthropocene and Catherine Malibu's work. So I was very much interested in discussions around ecoplasticity and how that might perchance like have a theory of environmental change and so on and so forth. So I was always interested in the theory side of things as opposed to the empirical, which would be like, how do I apply this theory to this situation that happens in the world? And sometimes I found that that limited my actual engagement with the work because it constrained it to an incidence where something was not actually apparent in the work. For me, this was the deciding factor about where I'm at now. I'm doing my PhD at Western University at the Center for the Study of Theory and Criticism. Most notably, figures that come out of that institution are people like um, Ben Woodard or Nick Mm Zurichek. So figures that are kind of very important for contemporary scholarship. And I would say that, you know, for me at least, my little, like my milieu has kind of informed (laughs) me about what I wanted to do. And I've seen a lot of like academics doing repetition of exegesis or whatever, and I'm doing that too. I'm okay with it. But I'd like to open up the possibilities for some sort of inventive practice in terms of, uh, you know, what we're doing with the scholarship that we're drawing from. So for me, at least, I like I said, with many titles I've gone through, many themes I've gone through, I wanted to explore, for instance, philosophy one of yeah. Laura Wells' period, so yeah. from the 1970s to 1980s, to just kind of get a sense of like, what is it that Laura Wells wants to break from in order to like do this kind of work? And I realized that, you know, that's kind of limited. It might be very good to do that sort of genealogy and to like analyze the kind of Nietzschean possibilities of and the latent possibilities that are found within Laura Wells' Nietzschean writings. But I felt that I wanted to do something more. Yeah. And some of that is going to be in our discussion today because a lot of what I'm dealing with is going to be in Homo ex machina, it's going to be dealing with uh, the themes of ordinary man, vision in man, non humanism, mm-hmm. all these kinds of things that I feel when I'm reading other secondary work and no shade thrown whatsoever to my peers whatsoever. But I feel like there's a lot of overlooked components of Laura Wells writings that really need to um, be analyzed in more focus. And some of that, you know, right before we met, Cooper tweeted out ego-xenological difference. And nobody, except a, a few, <laughs> and, I'll name the, and I'll name the few, Anthony Paul Smith and mm-hmm. Nick Eppert are the only ones who have written something about ego-xenological difference. And for me, at least, that is striking. So it's not, we can't blame ignorance or malice in this instance. No. Um, it's something like, we have a lot of Laura Well, a lot of non-philosophy to cover. Yeah. And we can't be saying that non-philosophy is the end result of Laura Well, but it is a collective effort. Yeah. And in order to understand, to be quote unquote, more Laura Wellian than Laura Well, which is something that a lot of people want to be. Yeah. You'd have to go through Laura Well in full. And that's where I'm at. Of course, I'm going to be quoting. Of course, I'm going to be introducing things and translating and doing what I do Mm -hmm. because there are, like I said, overlooked components and not because of ignorance or malice in this instance. I think it's just because, you know, we have a lot to cover. There's a lot of groundwork that needs to be discussed, some of which is in Homo ex machina, some of which is in a biography of ordinary man, some of which is in theory of strangers and yes. philosophy one. Everything mm-hmm. that I'm covering in my thesis covers that span of 1970 to around 1995. And to find that latent element that is found in philosophy non standard 
where mm-hmm. he talks about inventing a generic constant adequate for generic humanity. So I'm going to do an off the cuff translation of page 33, 34 of philosophy non-standard, oh. which I know Taylor, you're translating the work, but I also want to have uh, this kind of aspect at play. The okay. problem is that of a generic constant that is valid for the sedentary and the nomadic indifferently, mm-hmm. the autochthonous and the displaced, the inhabitants and the navigators, or the dwellers and the navigators, the earthbound and the extraterrestrial, the popular masses and the migratory flows, all of which involves generic humanity. So that's where I'm at with respect to non-humanism, vision in man, the ondemic, everything this is kind of connected to is implemented to what Laura Well elsewhere would consider his programmatic messianism or the critique of humanity's judgment. Again, it's nice that you you started to bridge into what we want to talk about, specifically your thesis, mm-hmm. which you, you've given the overview of. And I know that um, Cooper, when he tweeted that out about ecozenological difference, I thought maybe he he had a maybe he was joking around that it was a perhaps a, an unwieldy phrase, but he. Oh, no, actually, I, I love said that something, shit. You, you I love said something. It. Yeah, you said it was it was poetic, and so this is why I said I was like, "Problem? You got a, you got a problem with this?" Uh, so <laughs> see, this but, but, this mashes up Sterner and Deleuze in my little in your little my, your particle I'm, collider. Yeah, I'm smashing my high horses together, so to speak. <laughs> so, and as you said, Jeremy, this is a phrase that gets overlooked. And as you said, it's not about malice or or ignorance. Do you want to say a few words about that phrase before we get deeper into? what the end, the endemic is in your work and it's sort of, I guess, related to project and non-humanism, however you want to go about it. But yeah, say a little bit about that for the reader. Ego xenological difference is just one invariant amongst many. It gets evolved over time in Laurel's work. It starts off in Why Not Philosophy 4, Mm-hmm. which hasn't been translated except by me on yeah. blogs and in blog form. Hey, that's um, important. I guess it's important. And, and we'll talk about translations and why I do the things I do in a little bit, but it starts off as demological difference, Ooh. which is the invariant relationship between the demos and ontologos and that it is structured by philosophy. But the difference is, the difference that evolves over time is not just the difference between X and Y, which is seemingly how, you know, Laura well learns from Deleuze in particular, because the difference that Deleuze talks about is not the difference between X and Y. It is also this transcendental principle that governs and makes those kinds of discernible relations possible. Insofar as difference is involved, In Laura Wells' work, it is both the difference between X and Y, but also the difference that structures those relations. And insofar as there is a cause for that kind of way of thinking, Laura Wells tries to unsettle that entirely by saying, you know, it's not about the difference between X and Y, but rather what determines in the last instance? What is the cause that makes these things asymmetrical in a way? And it's that there are two ways of viewing that relationship. One is the predominantly philosophical tradition, Mm -hmm. which is the Greco unitary model of philosophy. Not all of philosophy, not all of philosophy is dictated around that. There is no such thing as the philosophy. It is a particular form of philosophy that says that for every sort of thing in the world, there corresponds a philosophical decision to it. So it's like a sufficient reason, Mm -hmm. a sufficient reason that governs that way of relating to the thought. And then there is the minoritarian or the non-philosophical approach, which is to say that the one or man, which is the real, determines that thought in the last instance. 
And when we get to this idea of ordinary, and because Larwell qualifies man as ordinary man and yeah. not not over man some, or something yeah. Like that. yeah. So ordinary man is the one who institutes the order for thought. Man in this instance is the one who is inalienable, individual, undivided in that literal sense. Mm-hmm. And unable to be entered into this kind of circuit that philosophy has instituted between one and two terms. So another way of saying that is that determination, when we think of this, is the full meaning, the real phenomenal content of Marx's statement that men make their own history, but do not do so just as they please. That's good. But the only difference is that Ordinary man is not homo faber. So we can't say that men make their own history. It's right. not about inventing that kind of history because that kind of causality, that kind of relationship it has to be interrogated because making and doing and all these other things, there's a present causes and absent causes that Laura Wells is critical of mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So in Biography of Ordinary Man, there's a whole line that says, ordinary man is not the inventor, the engineer, the homo faber. Ordinary man is the one who determines the order of thought. That's why it's called ordinary man, because ordinary comes from order and ordinality. So if you think about first and first, first science, for instance, in a lot of the other writings, it's first in relation to the last instance. And instance, I love this. <laughs> there is an ambiguity or polysemy of the word. Polysemy of the word instance. And uh, Etienne Ballybar does this uh, study of that in uh, Barbara Kasten's Dictionary of Untranslatables. Instance can mean agent. It can mean a level, but it could also be related to authority. So if we think about how the one or man is the determinant in the last instance, we have a way of judging and justifying the world from this viewpoint of the one in an irreversible fashion. Another way of saying it is that we are able to determine that kind of way in which we understand our relationship to the world. And so that plays really into homo ex machina for for every reason, which we'll get to. You are also giving an explication of the ondemic insofar as it is, you've described this question of vision in man, the, the in man or the in person or in people. Do you want to just maybe unpack that part yeah. uh, as, as, as a part of this? Because I, I think that that's implicit in, or you've made it explicit, but just to reiterate. To reiterate. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, you know, this term, the endemic is only making like sparse appearances in my thesis. Mm -hmm. I don't think my thesis is the opportunity for me to like actually elaborate upon something that really is going to be, I feel, something that I develop over time. Yeah. Something that I don't summarize in tweets and do several, you know, threads dedicating to explicate its difference or whatever from whatever system that already exists. So for me, at least, you know, I think in its very immature formulations, it is just a portmanteau and a radical simplification of what Laura Well would say is in person or the vision in one determination in the last instance, everything of that formulation. So in particular, in the last humanity is a way of thinking about this as well. So it's a portmanteau of both the French and like the Latin way of thinking about people. But there's also another word that kind of expresses this in a way called demotic. But I feel as though demotic misses out on what would be implicitly with respect to the imminence of people. Yeah, the radical Um, eminence, right. Yeah. Yes. So I think that for me as well, because we have several different words for this already, like endemic in everyday language is about relating to something that is in people already or indigenous to the land or something along those lines with regards to plants, but also diseases. And I mean, like endemic is related to pandemic. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I thought of it as an opportune moment to seize that. 
is a line about like how, uh, you know, Newton wrote his uh, most important work under a pandemic. And here I'm thinking like, you know, this is a concept that's like, Ooh. Oh, that's you know? fascinating. I didn't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So endemic literally means like, how do we relate to people in their person in a way that recognizes their individuality, their imminence, their way of understanding oneself without being divided by the world. And this is why I like, you know, I related to like in the last humanity, as opposed to just saying in the last instance, because I think that like when we over abuse the phrase determination of the last instance, however many times you want in a chapter, it doesn't actually capture what is the instance as the judge who is the humanity. And so my my way of thinking is I want to bring about a radical definition of people mm-hmm. that non-philosophy actually recognizes, which is people of the one. And the of is, of course, bracketed. If you want to say something about that evolution to the yeah. xenological. Okay, so demological difference, just to go back to that, is from the 19... 19- 84 issue of Why Not Philosophy, where Larawell's dealing with the philosopher without qualities and trying to deal with the problematic of a popular philosophy. And the popular philosophy is kind of like at odds with a very, you know, internal contradiction to what philosophy aspires to. Because with Plato, there's a line in the Republic, book six, where he said, I think Socrates is saying that the multitude will never be philosophers. Yes, right. And so this kind of gets transformed into like a question about who are, is there such thing as a pleb philosopher or a philosopher of the people? But there is a fundamental incompatibility between philosophy and people because of this governing relation, this governing invariant of demological difference, that man is, man is predicated by a universal. Man is the subject of this universal. Man as sex, man as language, man as desire, man as Mm -hmm. text, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that ultimately gets picked up and expounded on in a biography of ordinary man with what he calls anthropological difference. And then that gets further extrapolated in in throughout the introduction and has become like the the governing problematic of, of the whole book and is then continued in like theory of strangers Theory of Strangers talks about anthropological difference right from the problematic of the work up until like its first chapter dealing with principles of the science of men mm. or people dealing with non-humanism, which concludes that chapter. And you can't have a non-humanism without an ultimate critique of anthropological difference or a democracy, which would then result from, not result from that, but also be the determinant cause. Right. In the second chapter of Theory of Strangers, he deals with ego xenological difference, which is the invariant structure of the relations between oneself and another. And this kind of finds itself in critiques of intersubjectivity, critiques of... Psychoanalysis for one, right? Yeah, psychoanalysis, yeah. Yeah, but that's with the third chapter in particular, you know, like the third chapter mm-hmm. deals with non-psychoanalysis or non, mm-hmm. non-Lacanian non analysis, because however much, you know, Lacan says that philosophy is a discourse of the master, there still is some philosophical invariant, according to Laura Well, that is within Lacanian psychoanalysis, Interesting. With some yeah. of its statements. So with respect to ego xenological difference, you have the makings of a relation between which one exists as a stranger, but is man without having to exist. So man is the cause, the ego, and stranger is the subject of man. Laruel inverts that relationship from philosophy, which sees man as the subject of thought, a subject of these universals, these authorities, right, to the cause that determines, that makes it possible for there to be a subject that exists and institutes what would be a void or a no man's land between the one and the world. See, I like this... Uh, just just to interject for a second, I like this because this goes back to your point, how philosophy typically subordinates man 
right? And I'm using that word, you know, very particularly. Instead of subordinating mm -hmm. man, Larwell is thinking of of the ordinary, which the causality is reversed. It, you know, man is not the subject, as you said, receiving this causality top down from philosophy or however you think it, but it's unilateral, right? It's coming from man in the last instance. But anyway, continue your thought. Yeah, I don't really have much else to add, but these are things that are left unexplored, right? Mm -hmm. Like there yeah. are invariants that barely anyone has mentioned mm -hmm. in secondary work. And I'm not saying that just because, you know, there's lots more work to be done in English studies with respect to non-philosophy. And the French have that advantage over us with highlighting, I guess, you know, the tendencies within these kinds of works in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just turn over a rock that's been there for 50 years and expect some bugs to just be dead. Yeah. There is going to be some life underneath it that mm -hmm. has been, you know, making itself hospitable in this environment. And yeah, yeah. I think that a lot of people, this is a situation with, with my biography. How did I get to Laura? Well, you know, um, yes, which you I didn't, we, to... you didn't quite answer yet. So yeah, I, I, I know. I think, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. This is, this is, <laughs> this is a horrible session. No, Why no. are we starting from <laughs> this no, roundabout no. way? You, you, um, you've built up anticipation. See, you, you've, <laughs> you've built up the anticipation. So if you want to tell us yeah, about that. So yeah. like I said, with my, um, Academic background, you know, like I have a background in like Deleuze and, and Derrida and like being informed by that post-structuralist perspective. And, you know, I think that like being in that kind of like environment of New York City, you also get to sense that there's this interest in contemporary philosophy. You know, there's the quote unquote New York School of Media which consists of Dominic Pettman, Mackenzie Wark, Eugene Thacker, Alexander Galloway. And it's it's a made-up school. It's not like an actual, you know, like you can point to it. It's kind of like the Frankfurt School. It's a small group of academics that are kind of interested in problems of contemporary thought, dealing with like post-humanism or mm -hmm. speculative realism, triple O, all these kinds of movements that were then, at the time, still pretty nascent. Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. in its very first movements. And I think, you know, I finished undergrad in like 2014. And this was like, when a lot of attention was directed to these kinds of movements, I feel like it was very popular on social media that I was a part of. There was the blogosphere that everybody the was like, still, yeah. you yeah. know, still a part of that, like people, you know, it's not a movement, of course, you know, like I, I totally agree with Brassier here with respect to this kind of like online kind of phenomenon. But yeah. I learned from that online phenomenon. Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of a product of that. I learned from Taylor, from your translations at this time, that a lot of that is kind of informed and informing still mm -hmm. a great mm -hmm. part of like uh, generations that are, you know, in this kind of field. So for me, at least I was in that a product of that kind of like, quote unquote, generation, because for some reason I came across Laura Well and mm -hmm. I was like, this, this is, this is nonsense. And no pun intended. When I first started reading non-philosophy in Laura Well, it was rather that when I was starting to work as a bookseller, I worked at the this Barnes and Noble, which was the oldest Barnes and Noble in New York City. I think it was the first ever Barnes and Noble. Interesting. And then it closed down immediately after I started working there around Valentine's Day, 2014. But I don't think I had a part in the yes, explosion. Right, right, <laughs> right. But. When I started working there, I looked at the philosophy section and then I see a book that says univocal on the spine. And I was like, yeah. that's a Deleuze term. <laughs> that's so interesting. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I think the first book that I picked up was Sayre, Michel Sayre's work, before I picked up uh, Laura Well, because I think, for me at least, I think it was Biogea that I yeah, picked up yeah, from yeah. Sayre. And then it was Laura Well, because Laura Well had a book called Philosophy and Non Philosophy, translated by Taylor Adkins. No. And I was like, Oh, you know, it's got something about non-philosophy, which is something that Deleuze talks about in Difference and Repetition. And for some reason, I remembered like there was some scant reference to that, as you mentioned in your introduction to the mm -hmm. translation of, from what is philosophy about non-philosophy. So I was like, there's got to be something to this, you know, yes. yeah. there's got to be something to this. So pick it and up. And it had a pretty cover. 
<laughs> it had a pretty cover. Yeah. But yeah. the binding sucks. Yes, it so does. Mine's, I, think yeah. I, ha- I think I'm on my uh, third copy of the book. Uh, you see, mine is yeah. ugly, but it <laughs> has not fallen apart. So, you know, uh, I'm maybe you'll get lucky this third time. But, but yeah, yeah maybe, maybe. So I got my copy. And I think, you know, because I was kind of entrenched in that speculative realism kind of scenario where it's like, you know, why are we talking about the human? Mm -hmm. Why are we talking about the human? So when we get to this subsection on in the introduction of philosophy and non-philosophy that says non-philosophy is a human philosophy, it was like, this is bad. So I put the book away for like a couple of years until like, you know, I met a couple of people online that were informing me about like a little bit more about non-philosophy. Like I think, I think Cut of the Real by Katerina Kolozova was the first book that I read Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. was like enticing me to engage the work a little bit differently. So that was an impetus to study the work a little bit more clearly, but it was only until very, very recently, like 2018, that I started Mm -hmm. to take that line of work, non-philosophy as a human philosophy, much more seriously. Interesting. Because that was when I started translating. Mm -hmm. That's when I started like, okay, I need to look at the corpus. I need to understand it. I need to be able to like articulate some of the problems. This is going to be my research and my PhD. Yeah. The first book that I chose to translate, I think you remember this very well, was Beyond the Power Principle. Yeah. I was horrible at translating. I admit it. I do these kinds of things now. I'm able to practice and develop all this kind of stuff in the first place through the the moments where I learned from failure when, yeah. you know, like I knew that it was a bad translation. I didn't want it to be like complete and done. You know, I had worked really hard. It's a work in progress. Trans- and, and it yeah. is, as you said, it is a practice and you, you kind of develop muscle memory and you develop, you learn more from your failures. So I totally yeah. agree with you on that, but, but yeah, go on. I started with beyond the power principle and then moved on. I think it was, you know, when I was working on the minority principle that I got to see a little bit of a, like attraction to it. Mm-hmm. I was like trying to figure out what exactly made Laurel make the opening proclamation. Is it possible to think parts independent and before the whole? Yeah. And how that plays into a biography of ordinary man. It made me think about why Laurel opens up the book of the biography of an ordinary man with the proclamation, it is right to rebel against philosophers, which is appropriation of Mao, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's what exactly is philosophy doing? What exactly is this kind of like perspective that for me at least led me to doing the work that I do now on my Twitter and my blogging? I think, I think in part, the way in which I, and this is now segueing perfectly into translation translations yeah, situation. Yeah. I view myself and the work I also do for Araxium too, as some something of like a curator of both current and upcoming works that seek to kind of envision what could possibly come out of the work if the work was translated. Yeah. You know, what possibility? And I'm sure that like looking at Homo ex machina you get a whole different perspective on non-philosophy entirely when you read it because yes. it's like, it is a demarcation point for it's, it's kind of on the cusp, right? It's yeah. Kinda, yeah. Go ahead. But when, you know, you look at works that haven't been translated yet, you get a sense of a program that is very much part and parcel about like, why does Laura well emphasize the human so much? I read like a lot of works that were like, yeah, Laura Well is anthropocentric, you know, or humanist. There's an apparent humanism of non philosophy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and yeah, that's fine. But like, why? Yes. I feel as though some of the critiques of this are more of like along the lines of like, yeah, we've already dealt with this problematic. Why are we returning to it? Well, some of the problems that we've returned to are unsolvable problems that are unsolvable within philosophy, unsolvable within its categories, because in, you know, a lot of philosophical works, the vision of man is what would be considered, you know, a xenophobic or unidentifiable figure for others, not because of like the categories that uphold it, but the very practice of it. Good point. So 
so for instance, you know, in the essay, uh, changing posture or let us change posture and, and Antan Ka'an or, or as one, Laura Wells talking about how there exists a superior humanism, a superior racism mm -hmm. in humanist categories that man is a wolf to man, man mm -hmm. is a God to another man, or man is a wolf or, or sheep or mm -hmm. eagle, all these kinds of things, wasp and orchid, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> But it's never man is a man for man. Mm -hmm. So we tend to have this idea of the human always in correspondence with what, what man is not or what man ought to aspire towards. And the man par excellence is the philosopher. The excellent man to become mm -hmm. excellent is to be a philosopher mm -hmm. is Aristotle's perspective. And... You also have a lot of the relationships of the Ubermensch mm -hmm. uh, in Nietzsche and the incompleteness of man. Uh, man, is, man is a tightrope. Man is a tightrope. Man is a miserable pile of secrets. <laughs> yes. uh, man is all these things and more mm -hmm. that it never recognizes the man who is not the I think or the, sub, the subject, the spirit, the proletariat. Etc. All of them are all grounded in philosophical practices. So, this is why I say in my thesis, this is the opening, like the problematic is what is the relationship between philosophy and humanity? And we get a lot of the roles of philosophy to guide, to educate, to emancipate man or humans or people from something that bogs them down. Mm -hmm. You know, like you get this with Husserl, with the spiritual malaise of European humanity. But here, as I'm going to return back, what is the generic constant? What is the, the thought that is valid for generic humanity? What kind of humanity are we talking about when we talk about generic humanity? And so that's where all of my work is kind of situated in. And I think that was a very, very long way of <laughs> in framing oh. what, what we're going to be talking about today, no, this is, problematically. This is good because it does introduce us to the text you wanted to discuss, Homo Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. It gives a lot of context for it. And, you know, one of the things I remember when I first started looking at Laura Well, since we're talking about translations and talking about misunderstandings, I remember talking to my professor, Sid Littlefield, about about this book called Beyond the, the Principle of Power. And he looked at me and he's like, you know, he's punning, he's playing off of Freud, right? You know, it's beyond the pleasure principle. It's beyond the power principle. I was like, fuck. And, you know, that was like one of those first, you know, that was one of those moments when I hadn't even really translated anything at all. I was just looking at the French. And that was one of those moments where maybe I, if I would have taken it the wrong way, if he had said it with a more disdain rather than good humor, I might have just, just said, you know, maybe this translation thing isn't for me. <laughs> you know, I yeah. would have, I would have just been like, you know, nope, I totally missed that. I didn't even think about that. that's one of those failure things. But it's also one of these things where, you know, in translation, and one of the reasons why, not to speak for you, but just to speak with you about why we do what we do, specifically with the blogs, you know, translating these things that aren't necessarily going to always end up in refereed academic journals that are meant for everyone and meant to be used is that, you know, first of all, when I started translated translating, I didn't want to wait around for someone else to do it because it may not ever happen. So I wanted to understand, but then it, it also became this thing of sharing because I do feel like that first moment that I could have taken wrongly was that there is in a shared community in a community that of my professor used to call it a, a chorus of scholarly voices. So in the chorus of scholarly voices, there is a kind of, you know, perhaps Marx would call it the general intellect or whatever you want to say. There is a, in that communion, and it's not always agreement, but in, in that dialogue, there's a lot more to be learned. And, and again, that I'm kind of also self-justifying why Cooper and I do the the podcast. But I wonder if part of what I've shared here about why I started translating, if that resonates with, with sort of your, your outlook. I view the work that I do on my blog as, like I said, curation. And mm -hmm. curation could be like, you know, choosing 
the opportunity to like select things and privilege certain aspects or whatever, mm-hmm. but I don't like to privilege any one bit. As you could probably see from the selections I've chosen, even though like these are things that largely encompass Laura Well, I've also included like translations by Anne Francois Schmidt and Patrice mm-hmm. Guillemo, Serge Valdenoci. Yeah. Like figures that have a shared milieu of Laura Well's work. But I also like to emphasize that, you know, it's something of um, trying to be transparent with my audience as much as possible. With respect to translating, I owe it to my reader to be completely transparent about word choice and to express humility when I when I have made errors. And, you know, like there's that famous uh, way of thinking, which is like translation is always betrayal in some way yeah, or another. Yeah. I think that like, it's hard to be faithful to the original as much as possible. I don't think of myself as like a good translator. I think of myself as one who loves to translate, to amateurly practice it, and to recognize that sometimes I do make mistakes, you know, because grammar is very hard sometimes. And so is Laura Well. His yes. syntax is, is horrifying. And I don't think it's an easy task. I do the things that I do, not because I'm bored. Or because <laughs> like I have better things to do or anything of the sort. But it's the things that I, I deal with problematically, that I have something that needs to be answered. And sometimes that answer is found in the text. And I'd like to share that answer with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So when I've been like working through, let's say, the early writings and trying to work through what Laura Well calls difference with a capital D and why it's Nietzschean or what is the political libidinal that he's mm-hmm. dealing with? What is the difference between Sheenic materialism and political materialism? All these things that are left unspoken somewhat that really need to be given its due so that the future generations of scholars that deal with non-philosophy do have a resource potentially to dealing with these kinds of issues. Because I don't think I'm going to be able to tackle a whole genealogy of non-philosophy in my thesis. I think that's a horrifying thought. That would be like going all the way back to Plato. Of course, everybody has to go back to Plato. Yeah, right. To then then the apex in Laruel. And why why is this like the case? I'm not thinking that Laruel is the most superior thinker with respect to the philosophical tradition. But I think that he has a very interesting and very strong account of a theory of philosophy that has its roots in the imminence of life. And I mean, that puts it in the perspective of like Michel Henry and like other thinkers of imminence like Deleuze. But for Laura Well, it's like, this is what biography means. We have to make the theory and write the description of the life we lead. And it's not just that philosophy is a way of life. It's also a fact of life. It dis- it very much structures our everyday experiences. And that's very much why we, we would want to say that philosophy is the capital form of thought. Because capitalism is our everyday life. This is our experience. And what we, we need to do is change that experience so that it's not just the everyday, but is structured by our order, which is human. So that's that's where I would go from there, at least. The thought I was going to say was that it does seem like it could be easy to dismiss the idea that philosophy has a role to play in our everyday lives. But I think that part of what you've already kind of gone through, specifically with the way in which philosophy, you know, devises these categories and it practices the subordination of man. I think it's it's easy to overlook how perhaps what Deleuze would call objective and subjective presuppositions function in our thoughts, even in our feelings, our unconscious, like all of this is in a relation to, if not some sort of specific philosophy, then at least some sort of unrecognized or unexamined, call it a worldview, but it has these sort of philosophical resonances. And I think that it's easy to to think that, well, you know, if I'm not thinking about philosophy, then philosophy doesn't affect me. When in fact, that that's not the case. And specifically not what Laura Well thinks and, and even some other philosophers too. But yeah, I think that, that that point that you made about philosophy sort of engaging our everyday lives behind our backs, I think that that's something that's, that's easy to dismiss or not acknowledge. 
it was interesting because yesterday I was looking at Lemetry, the Cambridge edition, and specifically I was looking at the the translator, the editor's um, introduction, just kind of situating his thought in the middle of the 18th century in relation to sort of the, let's say, the materialism that was coming out of it. And it was kind of interesting. What I really liked about this, and I know this is maybe just kind of a footnote to the essay in general, to Larwell's essay in general. But what I found interesting was the fact that if, as Descartes says, animals are machines, Lemaitre is kind of taking that and going one step logically further and saying, okay, well, obviously that means that humans are machines as well. And if that's true, then if animals don't have a soul, right, then logically humans, humans, then humans don't, or that Lemaitre is saying, you shouldn't spiritualize matter. You should try to materialize spirit or the soul. And I think that amongst a few other things, like uh, his kind of moral theories and stuff, because he has a kind of Saudian type of take where, you know, except unlike Saad, he thinks that, you know, even if people should be able to do what they want or that, you know, blah, 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 they still have to be punished. Saad would say maybe not. But anyway, I thought this was interesting taking Descartes' notion of sort of thinking of animals as these little machines and Lemaitre kind of saying like, well, you're there's this unexamined center of this thought that you've that you failed to conclude with. So, yeah, I I guess that was interesting to put into perspective how Laurel starts this essay kind of talking about these different genealogies or these different little histories of man he starts out by saying there are two or three kind of traditions the first being like starting from like Descartes and the other with Nietzsche who did a genealogy of like how the technopolitical kind of like idea of the human body is not found in like philosophy but in its origins in the polis in the morals and the justice, the horizon, what he calls of the relations of power between the soul and body. And so from Nietzsche, then there is the Nietzschean approach, which is more or less arguably with respect to, he puts it in scare quotes, what he would consider the properly Nietzschean perspective of the breeding and disciplinary of man, Mm -hmm. disciplinarization of man. So he's not affirming that like, Foucault or others are affirming this either. This is just how there is something that insidiously occupies itself within philosophy and within practices of institutions that see this kind of continuous uh, practice of man-machine or machine-man at work. So what I'm going, going to recommend before we even get into this is kind of like, where do we situate this work in particular? So as we note in the beginning here, it's translated in 1980, you know, so. Or it's published uh, in 1980, but yeah. I yeah, know it was, yeah. yeah, it was published in 1980, but there are two major texts that are published in that time frame between, it kind of works as a bridge piece. Interesting, um, yeah. So 1978 sees the publication of Beyond the Power Principle, and 1981 sees the publication of The Principle of Minority, or The Minority Principle. And this work kind of seeks that bridging that gap. I would say it is actually the work that helps us situate understanding the break from philosophical sufficiency, what he would later call philosophical sufficiency, at least. What he would transform from the majoritarian Greco unitary perspective to the minoritarian approach of a biography of ordinary man. So this piece is also featured in a recent manuscript called. Uh, The New Spirit of Technology or New Technological Spirit. And it serves as one of the concluding essays. Oh, uh, yeah. It serves as one of the concluding essays of the book uh, alongside, um, what is it called? Ethotechnology, which was translated by, I'm going to butcher their name, Alyosha Dlebi in Kipal a couple of years ago. And that essay closes with the opening problematic of the minority principle, ironically enough. All of these kinds of things, I think, play into a way of envisioning this kind of work as more or less the problematic bedrock for that break to to occur. 
and to recognize that what Laura Well calls as biopolitical parallelism is an immature formulation of anthropological difference. And we'll get to that a little bit more, I think. I just wanted to give a little sense of that background to ground that work before we kind of like do more of an exegetical question back and forth. Let's see. You know, 1980 is still in the purview of philosophy one, but it is starting to indicate this, this kind of shift that Laura Wells starts to, when he actually starts to formulate non-philosophy, right? Which we could say is perhaps first indicated in the minority principle, but more rigorously and how do you say, well, I was going to say he orders the thinking in the biography, correct? The mm-hmm. biography of ordinary man. He, he kind of, maybe he even mentions this right in the preface to that book about, uh, about sort of the presentation is ordered more. I don't know if he says logically or just more, um, yeah, they have to be read in a linear order, right? Yeah. Like they have to be read as if one is ascending a mountain pretty much. Interesting, yeah. You know, that's not what he says, but that's the metaphor <laughs> I'm thinking of. Like, yeah. you know, there's a so- there's a slow ascent. And I think that ascent hits the stride at like Theorem 65 of the mm-hmm. book, which kind of solidifies the point about like what ordinary means, right? So okay. Theorem 65 and, you know, it helps me ground what I'm dealing with with respect to like human emancipation mm-hmm. and non humanism. Theorem 65, he writes, human philosophy, quote unquote, is constrained to an irreversible order of experiences of man than the world, mm-hmm. imposed by the finitude of the one or of the subject. There is an ordinality, an ordinary, more powerful than the traditional principles of reason. Mm-hmm. So he would refer to the ordinary as the real order that determines all possible orders. Interesting. Yeah. The real possibility of all orders. So it's a principle that is higher than the principle of reason. This plays into a lot of the uh, commonalities of what is being held at stake with the man machine circuit that he's dealing with in Homo ex machina. Because what he says in Homo ex machina is that man becomes this universal cog that serves as the master key for all the questions that are happening in the world. And that man is not only the measure of all, but also just like the cog of all, this universal cog in mechanisms that are at play. So there's all this kind of, uh, you know, the binding, the the nodding of the cog in these mechanisms that are at play and kind of makes it so that our lives are indistinguishable from power. Yeah. You know, and it's not just a biopolitics where it's power over life. It's biopolitical parallelism. And the hyphen there is very key key and important because in Foucault, biopolitics is one word. Mm -hmm. Biopolitical parallelism is the one in which life is inseparable from and in unable to be separated, you know, like not, excuse me, life is inseparable from the order of power and power is inseparable from the order of life. That's where the parallelism plays a part. He writes the synthesis of life in the machine mm-hmm. is neither me- mechanistic nor physical, chemical, nor structural nor behaviorist or behavioral. So a lot of this is really much about like how one can instigate the kinds of problems of understanding our lives in connection to these these uh, these mechanisms. And, and I'm going to add here that in Theory of Strangers, for instance, Laura Well mentions how philosophy is this superior form of biotechnology that yeah. could, could carve out our identity into these kinds of like mechanisms that are at play. So this is why I'm very much interested in like this conversation with respect to the work and how the situates really how to read non-philosophy, how to critique philosophical sufficiency plays into this work. What I really liked about reading this essay after I'm sure you saw I was mentioning Marx's fragment on machines, right? That part of the the Grun Risa that interestingly, you know, got published in 64 as this fragment in, in Italy. Yeah. The only thing that I thought was interesting was, well, not the only thing, two things, I guess, <laughs> was how it resonated with this essay, this question of 
machinery and industrial capital and or what he calls fixed how it comes to dominate the worker and integrate the worker skills and practices including thinking and including science science including technological you know innovations and these other things and, and how it's all it all sort of gets subordinated as cogs right to machinery and he does say something and we don't have to go into this but it's something that I think you would want to dispute or at least bracket where this notion Marx says something fairly cynical about how invention and of course he's thinking technological invention becomes a business or it becomes sort of a just another cog in the machine and your understanding of Laurawell and your you're obviously right to emphasize Laurawell's interest in the notion of invention would not be so cynical and not be so I guess technologically centered. Do you want to say a word about that before we continue with with this essay just just about this notion of invention that that you're interested in? Invention for Laurel is not so this is uh you know you've translated this from the program of the the um, mm-hmm. the philosophical decision but it's featured in Anton Kaan as titled Do not do like the philosophers invent philosophy. And invention for me at least is really the basis for which one is not just innovating novelty or bringing something about that hasn't been there before, but it's rather going back immediately to the quote I mentioned at the beginning with from Isaiah, from making swords into plowshares. Yeah. And, you know, there's a line from Antipadieu about the role that invention plays for the proletariat. You know, mm-hmm. there's a famous line about the proletariat's emancipation must be by its own hand. You can't just seize the state's machinery and use it to the, the proletariat's advantage. And this, right. this isn't the writings on the uh, Paris Commune. And so for me, invention does not just consist in saying, here's some occasional material. Let's, you know, try to do something that's going to be beneficial in humanity's services. No, what it rather means is like, how do we get out of these vicious circles of hell, Mm -hmm. you know, and we open up non-standard philosophy and there's a line to a citation to Daumel about like how man is a superposition of vicious circles and that the most vicious circle is this hell that we are enchained in as much as we are alive. And in French, uh, en vie means in life as much as it's alive and that it also unfair means mm. hell and in chains. Right. So there's yeah. like all these kinds of relationships about how the human being is caught within these makings of their own design that doesn't really allow for a space that shows this radical subjectivity of humanity. So it only shows subjectivity in the form of existing dogmatic, individualistic, and very much the dominant tradition of subjectivity. It does not recognize the radical subjectivity that is really underlying these kinds of things in the first place. So when it comes to invention, I think it's a struggle to invent. You have to first discover something that underlies before inventing. Growth and Deke has like a dialectic of uh, discovery and invention. Like there's that kind of relationship. But for me, It's a matter of what Laura Wells says in non-standard philosophy. Again, I'm quoting, I don't care. But (laughs) what does it mean to invent the possibility of invention? And that there are, in Tetralogos, a politics of invention. There are things that constrain and condition our existence and conditions to invent. So we need to invent possibilities for that invention to be carried out. And it doesn't allow for that in the space of existing philosophical practices. And more importantly, in this instance where we have experimentation becoming the very essence, imminent essence of life. And Homo ex machina, Lara Wells citing Nietzsche. Yeah. Nietzsche says, we all desire to become our own guinea pigs. And here we are. We're in the instance where we've become our own guinea pigs and we exercise this racism against ourselves in a way that is always going to destroy what would be significantly most individual. This essay, Homo ex machina, should be read not only alongside Deleuze's uh, postscript on societies of control, but it should also be read alongside Michel Henry's barbarism. It's a uh, 
a way of exercising this auto negation of humanity over itself. And that's a scary thought. And I think, you know, what we learn from Deleuze is precisely to invent and look for new weapons. And this essay highlights why minorities, who we are, insofar as like we are not blended with the state apparatus, we're not authorities, we're not stato minoritarians, is what he would be uh, critical of. But minorities are no longer this addressed people, they are no longer the other that needs to maintain and uphold the system that we have a figure of the tramp being the minoritarian figure par excellence the tramp in charlie chaplin's films being like this kind of guy who is uh, always the victim of circumstance right and the wrong place at the wrong time that's pretty much what we are we are autom- automatons automate uh, you know like automata that make sure that these processes are still in check. One of the things that always stood out for me, and Jeremy, you and I have talked about this, is, uh, and you've you've mentioned this idea from another work of Laura Wells, specifically about philosophy, but this notion, I'm thinking of the, the last few paragraphs of the essay, where Laura Wells is building up to this critique, this question of, superior racism. You, you've gone over it a little bit with your with the quote on Nietzsche and with biopolitical parallelism, but this, uh, this question of the superior form of racism, I think is how he calls it, right? Or I guess he, he, he says it both ways, but this, this question of, because he does end the essay provocatively, which kind of entails a further response or a a further, Mm -hmm. it calls us to think in a, in a radical way uh, when it kind of comes out of nowhere. I don't want to say out of nowhere, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So it's very striking. Just so you know, like if we don't cover anything that like we're still missing from this, just a little, you know, a plug, I'm giving a talk on this essay. I have a couple of actually talks where a lot of the things that we're talking about is all kind of like covering the same thing. So the London Conference and Critical Thought is happening. Program is available now, actually. July 8th and 9th. The issue is, is that it's in person at Birkbeck University of London. Hopefully streams for, for if, those if, of us. If it, isn't, if it isn't streamed, I could always link my talk to mm-hmm. my yeah. academia page. Yeah. I'm also giving a talk on non-humanism at Unlearning Nihilism. On Unlearning Nihilism is happening... June 23rd to 24th online, and then in person at the Stuart House in London at Royal Holloway's Center for Continental Philosophy on June 25th and 26th. I'm surprised that there are in-person conferences anymore after the last few years. (laughs) I know, but that's the risk that people are taking, you know? I, Um, I I will suggest, and this is just kind of before we get back into, I like that that you're you're definitely going to do this. I would suggest if, if they're not, they don't have something set up, you should get your phone recording <laughs> and your, record your, myself while yeah, I'm talking. Just do it yourself technology. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. Perhaps that'd be great. Anyway, to go back to this very quickly, cause like, I, I think I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I think that when we get this idea of the superior form of racism, Larwell draws this idea of the superior form of all that is from Nietzsche. And that means like, you know, we have to constantly transvaluate and reach this higher level of all that is. And here, at least, we get this sense of the uber machine or the super machine. I know Mm -hmm. you translated as uber machine. I I would go with super to maintain the superior, uh, you know, but... Here, I, I was you know, feeling I was feeling a bit Nietzschean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally get that. It's totally mm-hmm. fine. I mean, like that is what it is. But it's it's an exercise of humanity over itself. You know, mm-hmm. it's not everyday racism that happens, which is still pretty bad. Obviously, we don't. I want to highlight that as as like you know something that is that this goes away. It maintains itself within mm-hmm. this very practice. Laura Wall's talking about a macro politics that includes the very micro political formations that involve these very exercises, these very heinous and insidious forms of violence. 
but for him, there is experimentation of life over itself. Yes. That becomes the very essence of life. And, and it relates to Nietzsche's, you know, we're, we're our own guinea pigs. And the reason why it's a superior form is because it selects and seeks to make the difference of humanity consistently. Because we men I mentioned how, like, we have the inseparability of life with power. We have this idea of a new kind of genius or demon that experiments on themselves as if they experimented on others. That it was the measure of all things, but is not only just this metric of measurement, but is this super anthropological continuum that man is inseparable from. And it becomes this human type par excellence is what he calls it, human in scare quotes. The one who s selects and tests the positive within existing types. He's writing here that like, you know, it's the eye of the eye, the ego ipsissimum right. of Nietzsche. It's a whole egological continuum that constitutes this never ending chain. So you know how Nietzsche talks about a monumental history where all of humanity is linked up as if it's like a, a mountainside and that man is not inseparable from this humanity. It is everything is inseparable from exactly this monumental history. And this is why it's like much more of a quote unquote Nietzschean perspective than it is one that is upheld by Nietzsche or anything of the sort. This is something that even Laurel says Hegel did not want, that one gets their essence from the state. He says in my book, this is the whole new chain, a superior form of all that is, that interiorizes racism and becomes superior to itself. And it's a bioengineering. Yeah. And one that is one that is responsible for destroying everyday forms of the racism that are in there, but also dissolves states, classes, and so on, forming this biopolitics of the future that makes it so that everything is inseparable from one another. Even in this dissolution, there still is a whole process that one is producing mm -hmm. that is maintaining this complex. One such complex, it's a biostatist complex, means that men receive their absolute existence by and for the state machine. That their fusion or reciprocal inclusion will be done under a form, this is Larwell, that Hegel himself could not dare to dream. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And it's what he would consider the ultimate epoch of power, the ultimate era, the last era of power, which contains as much of the barbarism and inhumanity of the past as it is the inhumanity and barbarism of superhumanity upon itself. And he calls it a criticis universalis, universal mm. control, universal power, universal dominion, power and reign over everything. And all of this sounds very, uh, I don't want to say it, it sounds uh, terrifying, right? And I think it's, yeah. I, th I think it's a mint, I think it, it, it's meant for us to confront it as mm -hmm. terrifying instead of instead of understating the the issue but he does end with this note of potential of mm -hmm. hope anyway yeah the, yeah the hope is at least to what he would later call like i mean earlier in the essay he would mm -hmm. call the devivifying of politics and the depoliticization of life and that is only possible through when minorities are no longer defined as the object of biotechne there is no shiksal, which I think you've translated it as like destiny. Uh, uh, yeah, destiny. It's also in like Derrida as like addressedness, interesting, like, or okay. like a vocation that one has to uphold or a calling that they have to achieve. Interesting, right? So this would be a way of subtracting or unilateralizing, mm -hmm. to use that language, life from the mixture that is naturalist and political, mm -hmm. the life and power that is what he says perhaps is the unusable heart of racism. 
but it's still like manipulated to this day in a way that makes it so that man is not a man for man. It's man is always the other of somebody else. Man is always the subject to the whims of power. Yes. Just to interject before you know you continue, I was thinking about how something as simple as in the 19th century, so much of the discourse that goes into generating the pseudoscience of eugenics is about this fear of sort of white Victorian European families not reproducing in the numbers that the state would like to see in, in order to continue creating little colonial subjects to rule over their empire. It seems unrelated, but I think that's part of this politicization of vitality that he talks about, right? In this sort of uh, all of these, it's not the only heart of racism. Obviously, there's like a Lacanian, Zizekian analysis of it and whatnot. But but a lot of these discourses, you know, about, you can just think of the the securing securing a, a future for for white children and all this. Right, this right, right. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was going to refer entirely to how there is, you know, in Césaire, the discourse of colonialism, mm-hmm. that there's an idea of upholding a humanism that mm. is like, you know, all about the respect of the dignity of man and the rights of man. But mm-hmm. yet when we uphold humanism, it's a kind of pseudo-humanism when colonialism is a thing. So this is the same kind of aspect, but to, I would say, a larger degree Mm -hmm. that is more universal. And I wouldn't say that like, you know, colonialism is excluded from this experience whatsoever, but it is included entirely. And I would say is the very laboratory of this Curitisus Universalis. Mm -hmm. I would say that imperialism and colonialism and any sort of force that is upheld by European worldviews has its laboratory in those that are colonized. And I would say that what Laura Well is describing is not only the actual reality where that laboratory is experienced, but something that is internal to Mm -hmm. its very own functionings. So it includes the micropolitical, the peripheral, if you will. Right. But it is very much the the act itself of domination, as he says, as cause of sweet, as the cause of itself. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm like very much interested in non-humanism. Yes, uh, good. Is, I was going to ask about this. Yeah, please. Yeah. So to relate it to democracy, especially, I think this would be a good way of concluding, really. So non-humanism in theory of strangers is defined as a science that is more universal and adequate to man because it takes a unified theoretical approach by using philosophy and the human sciences as occasional material rather than like as the actual necessary conditions to understanding man. Right. But man is treated as the cause for this thought, the one who is ego. And not ego in the Sternerian sense or anything of that sort. <laughs> or uh, the Freudian sense. Or the Freudian sense. It, it's closer to like, you know, uh, Husserl and like uh, mm. Henri with the ego as this radical imminence yeah. of an identity, right? One's most in, in own most self, yeah, if yeah. you will. But it's also real. But so what we mean by real is not that it's like this outside or Mm -hmm. this, uh, the rupturing point of, uh, you know, the symbolic imaginary relationship, but it is something that is genuine and authentic enough to not be changed, unchangeable and indivisible. So when we talk about like non-humanism, we have to adequately describe this indivisible reality in such a way that it is an irreversible relationship or unilateral relationship. And you could use humanism. Larwell cites uh, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, even refers to this as a theoretical non-Rousseauism that forces Mm -hmm. people to be free from philosophical sufficiency. But all these kinds of sources are used as occasional support to develop a theory that is adequate to man. So that's non-humanism or non-philosophical humanism, human philosophy. Mm -hmm. And how this plays into democracy is that people rule over the thought or order the thought. It has nothing to do about the equality of thoughts. 
there is a democracy of strangers mm -hmm. before there is a democracy of thought. Yeah. So if one is upholding a non-humanist stance, arguing that there are people of the one who are philosophically undefinable, then you have a chance at being able to exercise a unilateral quote unquote sovereign. I don't want to use sovereign in the, you know, like the classical sense, right? A rule that is by people mm -hmm. quite literally. And, you know, when people get to order thought, that's where democracy is. It has nothing to do with equality of thought. I mean, democratization is certainly one way of like incorporating that approach because, you know, we do have a line in Introduction to Generic Sciences about like how, you know, man and person is this unequal that determines all things that are equal. But what is, who's the determinant factor here? Mm -hmm. And if people are the ones who are determining thought, that should be the democracy. Yeah. And this ultimately comes down to who are these people then? These people that, you know, like we, we don't want to define philosophically. Well, Larwell's got an answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's people of the one or multitudo transcendentalis, the transcendental multitude. And going back to Plato, yes, the multitude will never be philosophers. <laughs> But they won't be philosophers in Plato's sense because it has no upholding of different blood ranks. Yeah, this is a positive conception. It's a positive conception of never being a philosopher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one being, like, for instance, the transcendental idiot. Mm -hmm. One is not a thinking thing in that sense. They are not in a relation to thought that dictates them. That's where all this kind of situates itself, I would think, more eloquently, where we're talking about the freedom and emancipation of humanity to yeah. make their own destiny. That what I really like about this is, is uh, and you've said it before in the opening, but just to reiterate the way that Laura Will will talk about man as as one or real, right? In that in that theoretical sense, in, the, in a practical sense, but this notion that you could say the way that you're describing it, that just like the one man is foreclosed to thought, but can force it, but can cause it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man is the bearer of thought power as much yes. as man is the bearer of labor power, mm -hmm. if you will. But like the proletariat who, you know, is, you know, the savior of history in a way, Laura Well refers to the stranger because both the proletariat and the stranger are the subjects of the cause that determines them. The stranger saves the world from itself. So I think beautifully, you know, there's a lot, like I said, a lot to cover with Laura Well. And, yeah. you know, there's only so much we could do for a podcast, I think. But I hope that like trying to highlight the importance of this piece, at least, I know that we really didn't get to cover all the basics and whatnot of this essay, really. You contextualize it and you also kind of paint the bridge forward. I think that that was I found that to be more interesting and, and engaging, you know, than, than, than needing to, to explain it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I really liked how uh, we got to think about these things in, in broader terms and connected yeah. to, to, to other aspects of his thought and, and to uh, other, other thinking. So it, I think it, it does, it's, it actually provides a better service than, uh, yeah. And we'll have your talk uh, in, in July. Yeah, my to, talk. To do my talk. Yeah, my talk will be the one where we do the exegesis. I'm just, yes. I'm just hyping up the exegesis. I yes, say that's right. That's you know, right. I, I'm, I'm doing the preface to the, the, the face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like this. You know, uh, before we we conclude, there was something I wanted to talk about earlier. Was um, with ego xenological difference, and mm. uh, you know, obviously Levinas has a huge influence on Laura Well, and you know the way that Levinas talks about sort of the the face of the other is, is the height of God, and he'll talk about it in terms of being even being hostage to the other. Mm -hmm. But um, and I'll, I'll let you respond about that. That was just that was just offhand. But the one thing that I was thinking about specifically with egological ego xenological difference was Sartre in uh, being in nothingness has such a difficult time trying to, I don't want to say rationalize, but explain or give reasons within his phenomenology for the existence of others. It's this thing. He spends a lot of time on it and he, 
he kind of has to kind of say like, well, it, you know, there has to be others. That's just mm-hmm. how things are. And, and obviously, you know, I think part of that is, is, you know, I mean, Freud would even say like, we're born mm-hmm. helpless, right. We're born too early, you know, and right we, without others, blah, blah, blah. But I just, I was thinking about this when we were discussing ego xenological difference and funnily enough to start just being like, well, it, it just is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This puts it very beautifully and wraps up in a nice bow with respect to like what I think is very important with respect to non-humanism, democracy, and uh-huh. people. In John Malerka's All Thoughts Are Equal, there is a line where he says that the demos needs to be democratized. Mm-hmm. So then my line of argument is this. If the demos had to be democratized, then they must not have been people to begin with. And that makes it makes it a very questionable statement with respect to like who or what constitutes a human being. So when we talk about other people, right. Laurel would say, no, there are no other people because people are people. Man is a man for man, envision in man. Like this is precisely the core concept with respect to what non-humanism entails. So it's not a matter of democratizing the demos. It's actually recognizing the radical individuality of each one. All in French, tout un chacun is the word Laroel uses as each and every one. Mm -hmm. Each and every one. And if one is defined by man, everyone is a man. Like everyone is human. Mm -hmm. So with respect to ego xenological difference, and I think it also becomes in The Last Humanity, ecological difference, which is another invariant that like comes up in that book, you know, there's the whole evolution. It starts from demological difference, anthropological difference, ego xenological difference, and then ecological difference. Mm-hmm. All of that has a through line yeah. in Laura Wells' work. With respect to this kind of like other with respect to the stranger. The stranger is the subject that who we are when we exist in yes. relation to the world. Man is the cause. Man is who we are without you know existence, without any sort of like predicate that makes us who we are. Right. So this is where the kind of unilateral duality between cause and subject is determined. When we say that like we talk about strangers, We are talking about ourselves as we exist in the world, when we are no longer defined by the ontotheopolitical kind of regional thoughts that seek to say, this is your nationality, this is your race, this is your color, this is who you are. So I think, yeah, there's a very, you know, romantic idea with respect to like this uh, universalism Mm -hmm. that Laura Wells trying to envision. And it's problematic to a very strong degree to some extent, because this is coming from a French European philosopher. Yeah. No doubt. Does that mean we should discount it entirely without examining what exactly is at stake? So when you talk about ego xenological difference, it is precisely how we think about oneself and ourselves with one another, Mm -hmm. you know, and to treat the stranger who we are in everyday life as if we are ourselves not as an end obviously we're not repeating like a kantian kind of like the dignity of man or anything Mm -hmm. of the sort but that everything of authority which you know these universals of language sex power history etc that is mentioned at the beginning as these generalizing universals that structure our everyday experience are secondarized they're made second in comparison to first and to last. Mm -hmm. They are treated as occasional support for which we can develop a more, let's say, just society, a more just philosophy, a human philosophy. And for that, at least, is the basis for what we can do for invention. So I think that nicely wraps up everything in a bow, at least for me, at least. Yes, yeah. Like, because... What Laurel is doing with the stranger is not to institute some sort of xenophilia or xenocentrism or, you know, any of the sort, but to recognize that even in philosophical categories consistent of Greco-philosophical, Greco-unitary perspectives, and even Judaic thought, which interrogates these things, Mm -hmm. there is an ecophobia as much as there is a xenophobia. And that what we need to do is to challenge those kinds of bases 
in a way that recognizes a non-Greek, non-Jewish, but not necessarily a non, not necessarily a Christian yes. point of view, mm-hmm. because this is not a supersession, a su- supersessionist perspective whatsoever, and and not neither is it like a Kantian kind of like ends everyone's an, uh, you know treat people as if they were ends in themselves, right. Uh, this is rather that there is no final cause for humanity, that we have to invent our own means of emancipating ourselves from these vicious circles that we uphold. There is a lot of like, a lot of romantic ideas to be said, I'd say, I don't know, but it's what I'm interested in. I'd like to explore these further. You know, I would like to get people to interrogate these kinds of bases Mm -hmm. to figure out what exactly makes this, makes this thought, that makes a lot of people unsettled, uh, like unsettled with the idea that we are subject to our own abstractions. It's the idea that we have to be freed from the idea that everything is philosophizable or the principle of sufficient philosophy. And, you know, if Laruel calls this work a theoretical non Rousseauism, he is highlighting the idea of what is the force to be free. And, you know, Rousseau talks about the uh, general will. Right. And Laruel, Well, I think he tries to use that in the forced hand or the force of thought, thought power or something like that, that unveils this illusion, this hallucination that everything has to be philosophizable. And that plays into our everyday experiences to rewrite a biography or to write a new one or to even write one is what our task is. Yeah, this was great. I'm glad you came back to sort of inventing the means of invention. And part of that is inventing the means for our own emancipation, right? You, you brought it back to this, this Marxian notion that, that you mentioned uh, earlier in our discussion. As you said, it kind of does wrap it back around to why you're interested, romantic or not, in, in Laura Wells. One of the threads, one of the guiding threads throughout his work is this interest in explicating you know human emancipation as you put it and part of it is is precisely describing man as non-philosophizable and i think that that that's a good place to to end our our discussion it's, it's it's great it's it's a prolegoma prolegomena to any future non-standard philosophy <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you will to give you I another mean, give you another title for 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 one of your um words. well <laughs> You know, uh, you translated a piece that I think that really accentuates the idea, the prolegomena to any future science that would present itself as human. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Kant is lingering in the background. I mean, like most of Laura Wells' titles are Kantian plays in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, You get that with uh, Revolution Within the Limits of Science Alone Mm -hmm. and that one, like the prolegomena. And I mean, of course, Kant is a very important figure. For everybody, you know, yeah. like I think, I think he's he's still kind of the the horizon. The, there is so, there yeah. is something to be said, and and uh, he's one of those guys, you know. It's whenever the analytic and continental divide is brought up, and I do think that Brazier was someone who I, I felt feel indebted to when I think of Laura Well as not necessarily merely a continental thinker, right? That mm-hmm. there is there is a way that he the divide doesn't affect him, even if it may not seem that way. But Kant is one of those that the two traditions can both kind of claim in their own ways, you know, and so it's one of those things, where does modern philosophy start? And one of the answers is, is with Kant for better or worse, we're stuck with them (laughs) for now. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, this was great. I, you know, I really appreciate this being the opportunity to like test out my ideas and to talk about like, you know, I'm certain and hopeful. Well, I'm more hopeful than certain that people will actually gravitate to this in a, in a new light. This work, Homo ex machina, it needs to be recognized in its, in its significance mm-hmm. and to be part of discussions when it concerns Laura Wells' critique of philosophy. So I'm thankful for you for introducing this work in translation and, and thankful for this like uh, platform from Machinic Unconscious to speak about this a little bit more. And Machinic unconscious happy hour, excuse me. <laughs> if you're if you're not into the whole brevity thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just call call but, us ma. Uh, ma. I think that like one of the most important works alongside Homo ex machina is to have the whole book, yeah. the new technological spirit, the new spirit of technology, translated for a wider audience. Because I think this is the work, of course, I'm gonna repeat it again, that demonstrates the break 
It is a work that, you know, if you do not have this, you have no biography of ordinary man. You mm-hmm. have no minority principle. Mm-hmm. You have nothing. You could have Laura Wells, you know, repetitive Deleuzian, Deridian mixtures or Derusian and uh, Delidian yeah, uh, yeah. fusion that he carries out in um, from uh, Machine Unconscious onwards, but. Mm-hmm. Or textual machines onwards. You, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Textual <laughs> machines. Excuse me. <laughs> no, it's what did I, I say? I, I'm just you said imagining. Machine, <laughs> I'm, machine machine unconscious. Unconscious. I'm imagining Laura Well writing the Machine Unconscious and being <laughs> a schizoanalyst. I mean, there's a <laughs> there is a, there is a variance, right? There is a version of him in the in the early works that he's kind of in that you know in that in that parallel universe, right? The, yeah, the Bizarro Laura Well. Yeah, there there was a talk by like. Uh, um, Jordanko Sekolovsky, apologies if I'm mispronouncing, but he gave a talk about how in the 70s, Zaluz, Derrida, and Laura Well would go to the bar frequently and work together on like the weekends or something That's like awesome. that. And that Derrida said amongst the three of them that Laura Well was the most radical of them, which... I, I mean, like that's well. He's young. He's young. He's younger. He's so younger. That, that, are, that already kind of the younger generation are going to come off that way. But I do think that there's a a point to that, and I didn't know that they uh, they did that. That actually is is a great. Mm-hmm. Is, is just great. I wish we had a. I wish we had a photo of them. Just you know, there's just the three of them having a drink at a bar. Yeah. You know, yeah. chain smoking, right? You know, and... <laughs> I yeah yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I but assume anyway, they did. Yeah. Anyway, this is there anything journey. else? No, this is this, yeah. is this is this is great. I, I I think this is a good place to to conclude, and I know that you're you're wrapping up the revisions or the edits of your of your dissertation, correct? And I hope that that that's something that can go through smoothly for you. And um and so by the so the next time you're on here, we'll have to introduce you as Professor Jeremy Smith. And oh uh, boy, PhD. You know that's <laughs> keeping my fingers crossed for you. Hair doctor. So. Yeah, I would have, you know, I would love to have tenure or something along those lines, but I'm doubting myself now <laughs> thinking about that. But that, that's a whole nother conversation about yep. the, hor- the horrors of, of academia. We can leave that for uh, another <laughs> time. But but yeah, I mean, we're, we'll definitely have to have you back later this year. And because, as you said, the, there's a lot more to talk about. And by that time, you'll hopefully you'll you'll be sending out your manuscript for, uh, for your first book. Do you think that that's, that's going to be a, a goal is, is, yeah. is, is far, farming, farming out the dissertation into, into the book? I mean, I know that's, that's kind of, that's to speak of that's, academia. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. I want this work to be first a, a dissertation than an actual book. Yeah. I mean, my hope is that this has been my hope for this podcast and just in general with what I do for translations. I want to reinstigate and reinvigorate discussions surrounding non-philosophy. Yeah. And what I'm hoping for, at least with respect to our conversation today, is to engage some sort of like environment where we're not just using determination in the last instance 60 times in a page, mm-hmm. something along those lines, or using, I hate to say it, but like Hulk Hogan or like, uh, you know, Rambo as like figures to highlight somebody's like importance or extremity of the thought that is being said. I'm throwing shade at Alex Galloway. <laughs> but he's my one of my former profs, so like you can cut you can cut out the Alex Galloway riff, but uh, all right, like, all right, right, whatever. Well, uh, it, or keep it in, or keep it in because like the idea is that I want to, I well, want you know, to. He, he does listen to this podcast, so I know, I know, <laughs> your ass now. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I just think that, like for me at least, for me at least, like I want to be able to recognize that there is a role that philosophy still plays for non-philosophy. Yeah. Not in the sense of like, you know, oh, it's going to be serving as material or whatever, but it rather is, why do we call non-philosophy human philosophy? Why do we call it a non-standard philosophy or a non-philosophy in the first place? Not just because of the analogies that one can make to, you know, non-Euclidean geometry and axioms of that sort, or going beyond the standard model in quantum physics it has nothing to do with that. Why is it that human philosophy is non-standard? Something along those lines. That is why 
I think when we talk about the importance of this work and the importance of like all the trajectories that Larwell's taking, you get a sense of what that programmatic messianism is, that critique of humanity's judgment. And so wrapping it up once more into a nice bow, this is why I would call it The Cave in the Stars in my thesis and the book. I want to call, I want to highlight this freedom and this way of envisioning the future of humanity's future of humanity, freed from freed from philosophical constraints. Excellent. Once again, thanks to Jeremy Smith for joining us on this week's edition of Machinic Unconscious Happier with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. Thank you so much, both of you. Including the ultimate form of security, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in the block work orange. <laughs>